Hello everybody, this is Havoc, and welcome back to Humankind, a tutorial for absolute beginners. This is episode 3, and in the first two episodes, we went over the game settings and setting up our first game, and then the kind of move from the beginning parts of the Neolithic into our first culture selection, the Zhao in the Ancient Era. And real quick before we begin today, a reminder that this video is sponsored by Amplitude Studios. They are sponsoring the first five videos in this series, so a very big shout out to them for collaborating with me and working to get this done. In today's episode, we are going to take a look at the user interface, all of the new things that pop up with the creation of our first city, and then eventually diving into the city itself. I'm going to try and keep this a bit compact because I do tend to over explain things and I don't want you to lose interest, but it will look like we're not gonna get into a whole bunch of stuff in regards to progression. It is simply a mechanic explanation video today. So what we are gonna do is we have started Haojing. We have a couple of outposts. We have Uruk, we have Maza, Mazalai, however you wanna say that. And then we do have things that are going about over here. We just have a, a few scouts, a couple of teams of scouts is all we have. And we can see right here just real quick that we also have our luxury resources, which are things that we can capitalize on and you can see what we get every time we build a mine on it. So just from an exploration standpoint, you'll wanna look out for these before we get into everything else. Uh, these are always going to be beneficial for your empire and you'll want to kind of potentially focus for future outpost expansion where you may want to go prioritizing strategic resources in my opinion over those luxurious resources, but certainly don't forego creating an outpost to get one of those. But enough of that, we are gonna start over here in the top left. Again, I may move quickly, but there will be timestamps, and I hope I explain everything efficiently, even if I'm talking rather fast. We still over here, if we hover over the empire, it gives us our breakdown of how many stars we have. We already accomplished an agrarian star uh, from the previous era. And we can see that there are different ways to gain era stars. There are seven different categories. There is Aesthete, which is gaining influence. Your Territorial Expansion, which is how many territories have been incorporated into a city. We have Builder Stars, which is how many districts that have been built. Agrarian Stars is population-based. You have Gold Generation. You have Technologies Researched. And lastly, you have your Military Units. Now, a quick important thing to note is that your Aesthete Star is up on top, meaning that if we were to click on here, we would actually get the most stars. This will pop up in the next turn. It's kind of a visual bug, kind of a deal. Uh, we will be gaining stars, but mostly because we are the Aesthete. So we, it is a good point of focus to choose a culture based on what you think you can accomplish, along with a combination of their benefits, their buildings, their Aesthete affinities, and then, of course, their emblematic unit. And then if we hover over this, we can see that we are leading the fame game by 170 points across the board. That'll change, that'll fluctuate. One thing I want to caution you on is to get worried about being behind. There are so many ways to increase your fame as you play Humankind that being behind even by a few hundred points is going to easily to make up, I should say. So don't ever fret. This is more uh, for just a quick reference to see where you are, where your opponents are as well. We have our error progression right here. We have our esthete. If we hover over it, we can see the benefit of our affinity and then also the specific bonus that we can do so we can as a cultural blitz focus our cultural stuff on within a territory if it's being taken over by someone it costs money but it does give us some influence to combat the essential cultural invasion so we will probably end up using this uh, a couple of times in our tutorial series we'll have to see when we get there What's new is your diplomacy screen. We can see we have Mets. I do believe these are going to be the Harapans, and we have four other opponents on top of that that we haven't met. So if we click on this. This is where I greet you, impress upon you the wonder of my people, and tell you my ambitions, no? Maybe? <laughs> All right, so we have an introduction here. Odds are we're about to give ourselves an introduction. Okay, good. So this is your diplomacy screen. This is where all of the interactions to uh, positive or negative against other cultures will happen. We can introduce ourselves. It is my great honor as the leader of a great people to greet you in their name. You have something to say? 
So we introduce ourselves and it opens up more about everything we can do and also opens up some interaction. We're gonna start first and foremost at the top here. We are currently at peace. We have just met. There's nothing negative or positive that has gone either way. As a peace category, we can attack each other within either our empire. So for instance, if he were to cross into my territory, I could attack him or we could attack each other in neutral territory, say over a resource or things of that nature. And it wouldn't require you to declare war. Now it will make a grievance. We'll get there with the crisis uh, whenever it becomes available, but we can actually attack units and whittle down a potential military faction uh, without actually declaring war. And I think that's a really cool feature. Now we have no new trade exchanges. They cannot be set by the other empires. We have armies are unable to enter territories attached to the other empire cities. So that is when we attach. So we will see here by the end of today, I will attach this territory to this city. It is, will no longer have the hashed marks. It will have the solid blue line saying it is part of the city under a peace treaty. And assuming we don't have open borders, they will not be able to go in there. And then lastly, uh, we will be able to see the other position of the capital city. Now underneath it is ideological proximity. This is essentially how uh, our ideologies, which we'll get down in the pink down below, how close we are in terms of ideological outputs, essential. Uh, right now, we are all in the very middle, as we'll see in just a little bit. So that means we all are basically kind of like family. We haven't diversified and broken away from the core of who we were at the beginning to make any difference. So right now, we are essentially kin, how they see us. This is a justification for war in the future, is uh, being able to say, hey, we don't have anything in common with this culture as our people. We're going to lead into war support here. It'll be a, a more justification saying, hey, these are not our people. They are nothing like us. We should go to war with them. And so that does lead into war support. War support is essentially how supportive your population is of the current war that is going on or the potential for a war. As I just mentioned, having a kinship ideological proximity, it will be very, very hard to bring this war support up to justify a war because it's essentially declaring war on family. And at least this early in human history it may not have been the uh, best solution to do. Now we can increase our war support by doing demands on crisis. We'll get there again when a crisis pops up. And we have to have 80 war support in order to actually declare war officially. We can do a surprise war. We can do that right now if we wanted to, but we would get a whole lot of debuffs, including a degrading of our own war support. If it gets down to zero, the defender automatically wins uh, and it goes down quicker. And you are seen as a traitor. Other factions don't look on you very well. It's not really worth it unless you just so desperately need something that it requires you to do a surprise war. So through demands, you will increase your war support. And then through taking their cities and winning battles, you will decrease the enemy's war support to zero, where then you can uh, discuss peace terms. All right, so we have this right here. This is proposing an alliance. Obviously, if we had an alliance, it would open up some treaties uh, that we'll see later down the line. It's not gonna affect us right now. I very seriously doubt we could get to that point this early in the game. Uh, so that's kind of your relations. This is an overview of how everything goes right here. We are going to look at trade just for a second. We can see here that we do have access to horses and copper, but we cannot use it. We have to build a mine. We don't have the technology or the means to exploit it. It's just simply within our boundaries. We don't have any luxuries in ours that we can see at the moment either. But we also don't know what they have because we haven't opened up trade. Now, treaties is how we open up trade. The first thing you're always going to want to try and do is go after trade luxuries, which essentially means we can trade our luxurious resources, but not our strategic. Most likely they will always accept that. We will come back to this menu uh, once we take a look at the rest of this. But you can see here, we could trade luxuries and we could trade everything. Currently, we only have our capitals revealed, but we can share our maps if we want to in the future. Currently, we have closed borders, which means an enemy unit cannot go within our borders. If we did open borders, those units can walk through our territory. Tolerate skirmishers is what I meant when I said that we could attack an enemy unit inside of our own territory or in neutral territory without declaring war. 
a big caveat right there. A non-aggression pact basically means we agree that we won't skirmish out in the open, that we will not declare war on each other, and we won't uh, we won't attack each other. So all of this is dependent on how they think of you, and we do see how they think of us by looking over at the hesitant. This is their attitude towards us, just us. So we can see right now they are hesitant. We just met each other. We don't know anything about each other. The only thing that's in the positive is that our ideological proximity is high. So that means their trust of us is stable. It's not going up. It's not going down right now. And the only thing we've done is that ideal ideological proximity. We haven't tried to trade with them. Our borders are not closed. So those are, would be the two negatives that would happen currently. None of that has happened. So we are good right now. And then their strength is comparable. Now, if it is one way or the other, they may be scared to do anything with us. So that could be a negative. But if we are also not powerful, they could potentially kind of push us around if they wanted to. Pushing a demand maybe is a little more brazen because we are significantly weaker. It's always important to see this. And you will see in notifications down here as you play that the attitude of the Harrapins has changed. So you'll go into it and you'll see it's changed. You hover over it and you'll see kind of what's going on. It's a great way to see how you can push these treaties, right? Now over here, we do have the Harrapins. They are in the ancient era. This is their symbol. This is their uh, current fame score. How many stars they have progressed in the current era they are in. Again, we have these badges. Uh, I don't know that I've explained badges. So there are multiple badge types. I honestly could not tell you how these affect because I haven't seen them too terribly often. But you see here, we have the Diplomatic Badge, which has three different levels, which you can be a traitor or a hero. And the Diplomatic Badge, we can become a warrior or a pacifist. And with the other Diplomatic Badge, uh, we can do a thief or a merchant. So it just depends on your actions throughout the game. I'm still not 100% on that, so I don't want to comment. But the most important feature when trying to figure out what these guys are all about is their characteristics. And this makes up the persona that you can do yourself to send to your friends or your community, etc., etc. So we have two archetypes, two strengths, and one bias with Midas of the Harrapin. We can see under his archetypes, this basically gives him the personality of the character. We can see that he is cool-headed, he weighs the pros and cons before reacting, and he's also forgiving, which means that any errors, anything we do against him in the past, will be quickly forgotten. And that's good for us, so if we were to do something to grievance them, they would forget it in the long term, which is always a good way to rebuild a relationship. We can see the strengths. This is going to affect how they play, what they might be going for, uh, what plays to their advantages. So we can see here that they are a capitalist, which means they get 15% money on all cities. And they are also a merchant prince, which gives them 100% money generated from ongoing trade on all cities. This is a very financially focused kind of culture. So we have to keep that in mind. They may be very willing to trade because it plays to their advantage to trade as much as possible. And then lastly, they're biased. This is something that they will pursue within their empire. So their bias right now is for luxurious. They prioritize the collection of luxurious resources and want to control all the manufacturing. So we can see here, he sounds very willing to trade and more often than not, unless you got off to the wrong foot, you can propose a trade luxuries. Both our peoples need this. There is much to admire here. Accepted. And they will usually do this right off the bat. You'll also notice that because I have proposed the treaty, I have to wait five turns to propose something else. The odds of them doing something else right now are very slim to none. But if you'll hover over it or you'll click on it, see it takes five influence to do that if we wanted to. Or we can simply wait five turns. And then if we look over on hesitant, we propose the treaty to them and our ideological proximity is high, which means their trust of us is improving. That's going to be good for us. So the next time we interact regarding uh, this diplomacy screen, it may go even more positively. The last thing that I forgot to mention is your money. This is important because it'll let you see how much you're making, but it'll also let you see how much you have so that when we make trade deals, you can judge how much without having to hit escape looking over on the right side, seeing how much money you have, and then going back in. That is about it for Diplomacy. 
We have met the Harrapins, and I don't believe we have actually discovered their capital, but maybe it'll pop up in the next one. Moving on to the right side. Now, instead of just having influence, we have influence plus how much we're generating per team. We can see we are making six influence from the district. We only have one district at the moment, and it is our administration center or our main plaza. You can also see that we are making nine money. We are making nine money from the city. And if we were to hover over it just real quick, you see we're making it from the plaza and from the traders. We'll get into that at the very end of this episode, probably. Lastly, you can see over here that we have our resources that are within our empire. They can be seen. We can't extract them right now, but it's just letting you know, hey, you have the ability to have these. Maybe you should focus on it. The last thing we'll see in this is that there is a city cap. You can't have unlimited cities in this game, not without taking a hit to your influence. Right now, we are at one of two cities. We could take Uruk and make it into its own city if we had the influence for it, in which case our cap, our soft cap, would be at two. If you go above it, again, you start hemorrhaging some pretty strict influence. So we have room to expand to another city, which is something you'll want to think about in the future. We've gone over this for our military forces, but now that we have an established outpost and we have established cities, we can show what this looks like. Under the cities tab, we can sort by all different filters, but we can get a very quick breakdown of what each city is like. We also see these policies. We will look at these policies once we get to the city stuff, but they are rather important if you want to play more strategically rather than just kind of play on autopilot. Your outposts, they just simply give you your outputs. Uh, it is limited what you can build in an outpost versus a city, but it also might be advantageous to. And I'll get to why uh, whenever we are basically able to. The other thing to mention is on the cities and outposts is that we can build cultural wonders. The main difference between humankind and the other guy is that not everyone has access to all the wonders. This isn't where you're two turns away from completing the pyramids and then all of a sudden the Americans make the pyramids two turns before you and oh, sorry, you were just that too late. It doesn't operate like that here. Instead, you have to claim a wonder using influence. As you can see, they're currently locked to us because we can't do anything. But these wonders have a series of benefits to them. For one, it will typically, depending on the one, it'll push your faith. It increases stability, which as I've mentioned before, is a term of public order that we'll get to whenever we hit our city. It will pretty much always generate 100 fame, and then it will have its own benefit. Now you can look at all these and decide what you want to do, but typically I go with the Temple of Artemis or the Pyramid of Giza. Minus 25% on a district industry cost is a pretty nice discount, but the Temple of Artemis allows you to ignore the forest movement cost penalty, treating them like a prairie, which is also really, really cool. So be thinking about in the future what you want to accomplish with your empire and what wonder you should do, but you should totally do wonders because they are usually quite beneficial. As we move out from here, there's only a couple of new things that we see down here before we get over to that. And these are different markers. You can uh, show either for yourself um, the owner of the tile, for instance, um, we could go, why can't I place anything? It could go here. No tile owner. We're not going to worry about that. We're just going to go everyone. So for a defensive thing, this is more for allies, especially, but say you were under attack and you didn't want to let your other teammates know in public what we were wanting to do or what we were wanting to defend. So if I fall back, I can say, Hey, I'm going to fall back to right here. You guys meet me here and we'll take on the enemy. Or you can do the exact opposite. Of course, I'm doing everyone, but it's okay. So you can say, hey, I'm going to attack this spot because this is their only source of horses. And if we were to take them out, they couldn't build. Lastly, the heads up. This is just a simple, hey, I'm interested in this. You could do this in multiplayer sessions to denote something you are wanting to strive towards. And if someone were to come back and kick it back, you then would obviously say, hey, I'm, uh, I don't like that. Let's uh, let's duke it out. So the markers are really cool. It's also just good for your own general thing. So that way, if you're a zooming out and you're wondering where I should expand to next, oh, what's this? I've got a marker. Oh, that's right. There's horses here. I should probably build an outpost. So for any little reminder, 
The last thing over here, and you'll notice this is where your mandatories comes in. This was in the settings video, the very first episode, where we can see that we have different things to do before we can technically end our turn. You'll also notice that we have this research here. That's the same thing here. We'll get to that in a moment. We need uh, something to do in our city, something to build or to start. And then we also get to found our first religion. I'm going to click on this and walk you through it because that will kind of bring this section into play. Awesome. Create your religion. We can pick the base of our people's beliefs. This is the foundations of your religion. One quick thing to add here is that you can always start your religion, but you don't have to keep working on it. If you just don't want to pay attention to it, that's fine. But another thing is that every other civilization is probably going to try and work on their religion as much as possible. There will be factions that might get to certain tenets. We'll get to tenets in a second. Then you, and they may be very, very beneficial. For instance, as we see, uh, well, let's, let's take a look and choose polytheism over shamanism or shamanism, and then we'll get into the tenets. So polytheism gives five faith per number of attached territories, while shamanism gives one faith per, uh, per population. There are benefits to both. For instance, if you will have in the early game a city with five different territories attached to it, that's going to give you 25 faith, and that is per turn. So that's going to be a big boost in the early game. Your population may not be very high, though, but you flip that around in the future, it may not be too easy for you to expand and get new territories. But by goodness gracious, you have, you know, 400 population. Then all of a sudden, shamanism makes sense over polytheism. So it's whatever you really want to do. I think for this run, since I'm going to be attaching a few territories very early on, that 5 plus faith per number of attached territories may give me the ability to dominate in the area right off the bat. So we choose polytheism, and if we click on here, we see a few things. For one, our areas that we have currently from your city to your attached territories are automatically going to start converting. They don't automatically convert totally, but they will start. We can see even all the way over here. It takes a little bit longer because we're not a city and we're a bit further away. We are the religious leaders. We don't have any holy sites yet, but we can build one. And you have no followers because no one has officially converted. The way that you get to tenets is by getting more population under your faith. And that's a population that isn't just yours. If your religion spreads to other people, it is a way to gain that. If you do end up pushing religion, try and push it a little hard because it will give you tenets sooner. Now, tenets are different abilities and buffs to your, uh, to your religion. Be in harmony with nature gives plus two stability on a river, which is really good. Note that any time it says a river or a forest or a mountain or anything of that nature, it is specifically talking about any tiles that you are exploiting. It does not mean all tiles within your territory, just the ones you are exploiting. So if we were to look here, we can see that we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine territories or nine tiles, excuse me, that are all exploiting a river. Even over here, one, two, three, four. Four. We have a lot of tiles that are exploiting a river, so it might be good to do that to give us some more public order. Or we could get influence on a mountain. Again, we have to exploit that mountain, which is not currently something that we are doing right now. And in fact, probably won't happen until we take this territory. Not something we really want to do. Smite Unbelievers gives experience. You get the idea on the different things it can do. Just know that if it ever says anything like this to industry, on a forest or a woodland that is on an only exploited tile. So abstain from intoxicants and intoxicants and be in harmony with nature are two of my favorites. Uh, purge idleness is something more of a, a later game kind of a deal, but you could certainly push it if you wanted to. We only need 25 population to push our first tenant. We won't get to it in this episode, I completely assure you. Moving on to society. Society ties along with your ideologies, and we saw the ideological proximity in the diplomacy screen. And this is where it starts deviating if you choose to do so. So we'll notice right at the top, we have four different ideologies. Well, we do four different ideological sectors, and we have different spectrums of that ideology. For this one, we have collectivism versus individualism. 
world versus homeland, liberty versus authority, and progress versus tradition. We always start right in the middle, which is a, a huge benefit in the early game because it gives us 10 stability on all cities per category, which means right off the bat, we have 40 stability on all of our cities as long as we stay right down the middle. Now, through events or through civics, we don't have any civics right now to enact, we can start to deviate from that to go to either side. You can only be on one side of the spectrum for each different category. Each side has different advantages. We lose stability, but we gain another advantage. So we can see here, if we moved towards individualism, we would get plus 10 money on every city or an outpost. If we moved over towards collectivism, we would get 10 industry. A homeland gives you combat strength, world gives you food, we can see authority gives you vision range and detection range, while uh, liberty gives you influence on an emblematic district. Now that will stack later in the game, so that is something beneficial to go after. Tradition focuses on faith, while progress, of course, my favorite, focuses on percentage of science. Now again, as we enable or enact civics, we don't have it yet. We will start to deviate from that and you will see that uh, probably if possible by the end of this episode but if not right at the next beginning uh, and then our stability our average stability the higher it is the harder we are able to push our society's ideas but we can see here we are at a hundred percent because we're just it's right in our homeland but we can see down in this territory that because we are up next to the harrapins they are actually converting this territory which is ours to our to their culture rather and the only issue with this or the main issue i have with it is that uh, they can actually push a grievance saying hey this is technically our people because you know our culture and our society is present there we should own that land it should be ours and we can give it to them or we can say hey sorry jack we're uh, we're definitely going to keep it so it's up to you how you want to push it I, again, just for me, I tend to push progress always to get that 10% science. I really like the idea of liberty because it pushes influence, which also generates more influence for us to use for uh, integrating, enacting civics, and integrating territories, building cities, things of that nature, creating wonders, or at least claiming them. Uh, as for the world versus the homeland, I do enjoy combat strength on a unit. But at the same time, 10% food isn't bad. It's these top two that I flip-flop constantly. I do tend to go towards collectivism because it builds up. But again, it's however you want to approach it. That's a rundown of society. The last thing we have is progress. Progress is just technology research. That's as simple as what it is. Uh, right now, we have nine science per turn. Uh, just from our basics right there, it goes up as we do various things on the map. And we don't have a technology selected. Now, this is going to give us kind of a short list of technologies it thinks we should do. But before we go and actually select, I want to give you kind of a rundown on what technologies I choose and why I choose them. So for me, what I really enjoy doing in the ancient era and really all the other eras after that is I like focusing on things that give me constructibles. Now, constructibles are things like your animal barn or lumber yards or your stoneworks they do not go on the map themselves that's reserved only for districts but rather they enhance districts and exploitable tiles now that's very very important in the early game any chance you can essentially build less districts and get more out of it it's going to increase your stability it is going to allow you to focus on other areas of resource generation and overall just is good for expansion. So it also depends on the tiles that you have around you. We have a horse right now. We have the ability to get it, but we don't have the ability to exploit it until we build calendar because an artisan's quarter is what you will build on any luxury or strategic deposit. And you have a granary, which gives you two food per farmers. This is going to be very crucial for you because at the moment, I don't see a change in any time soon. A farmer only generates six food per turn. But your average pop, your regular population, consumes eight, slightly plus, slightly over eight food per turn. So by building a granary, 
you essentially ensure that every farmer that you put in your city cancels themselves out in terms of food consumption. And that can lead to a rather large increase in food production overall and food surplus, which is required to obviously make pops. So we can go with granary first. Then we will go down to domestication because I can build, I can start to build stuff and I have my, my horses to build on that giving me something like this, which is five food per horse and one food on a farmer's quarter per adjacent farmer's quarter and one food on a farmer's quarter. I'll explain that when we start building districts in this episode. And then I will actually go down to carpentry. And the reason for carpentry, and this is why I say it's important to look and see what you have around. We go down to Haojing. We can see that we are surrounded by forests and mostly rivers on our exploitable tiles. So we have industry and we have food. If we go over to Uruk, which we will integrate, we have prairies, we have forests and a river, we have forests and a river, we have prairies and a river, and we have prairies and a river. All of these tiles we are exploiting at this very moment. So if we build any constructibles, it will influence the resource generation of anything that is being exploited. So if we go to our technology center, we can see that carpentry increases your industry uh, by one on a forest or a woodland. So if we were to build this, and when we integrate these cities, we will have one, two, excuse me, three, four, five, six extra industry every single turn. And we can see right here, we're only making 21. So just by building that one constructible, we will increase our industry production by what, 25%, maybe uh, a little bit less or a little bit more. That's pretty impressive for simply building a collectible that doesn't place anything on the map. So that is the kind of direction in the early game that I choose my technology. So we would go carpentry. I actually wouldn't do masonry because we don't have mountains, stone fields, or rocky fields around us. Rather, I would go to irrigation because you can get flood irrigation, which gives you plus two food on a river. So you can see here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine tiles. That is 18 extra food. That is two and a half pops worth of food generation that you didn't have to build a district on the map. So I kind of see it as basically free resources. That's how I approach it. So we have our four technologies that we'll research now. When we get through those, again, I don't really build for military in the early game because it's not too terribly important. You can get away with not having very many wars uh, before you have the ability where you're building a lot of science. Now that that's all over with, hopefully all three of those make sense and can give you a better sense of direction. We are going to take a look at our city, Haojing. Now, right off the bat, we can see the different industries that we have, the different resources known as FIMS, which is food, industry, money, and science. Next, you can see we have pop. We currently have a population of three. We currently have three out of eight. That is significant because if you'll look underneath, this is the current number of people that are in this category, but also how many jobs are available. So it starts with the default uh, of two per category. Two times four is eight. That's how you get your population cap. This cap is another soft cap, but know that if you go over it, it will actually kill off any additional people. So keep that in mind. You do want to build four jobs and you typically get jobs by building orders. Now there are other ways. Certain constructibles will have a job availability kind of deal, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but for now, we don't really need have any jobs the only purpose of building a district would be simply to create more resources now you also see here uh, if we go into this next corner that every pop that is in a category generates six of that reason so as a result we are making six food uh this one farmer is making six food excuse me this one farmer or this one worker is making six industry six money actually no science but we do have a defunct of six because of the main plaza and because of astronomy but you'll notice here that we are actually making negative food and the reason for that is we have three pops three pops are making 85 so which is why i say that each pop tends to make eight and a fraction uh food 
per turn or consumes that much. And because we only have one farmer here, we are actually at a negative. So we are exploiting. We are exploiting three. Is this a three, eight, nine, 11, 12, three, eight, nine. I did 13, 12, 13 food from our exploitation. I wish I could uh, count. Apparently I can't. We get three food from the main plaza based on where we started. And then we get that six food per turn from that pop, but it's not enough. And you'll see here, we are actually will not get another pop for another 30. Or we will lose a pop in 32 turns. We can solve this right off the bat. We don't need money. Not, not in the way that we'll need it in the future. So what I can do is I can actually drag and drop that over there. We now have two uh, farmers that are making 12 food, which puts us three over. Now, unfortunately, we are going to make another pop in the next turn. It means we'll be right back in the same boat. But I don't have enough jobs, which means it will default to the next thing based on our policy. So we're gonna look at the balance policy. This is the default policy, which it assigns pops whenever you generate them. We have different uh, things we can do. I'm gonna go with expert policy because it allows me to choose my own. So we can see here that now it's kind of unlocked. And if I were to prioritize science, it's gonna move as many as it can over to science, fill up that slot, and then it's going to add them to food and fill up that slot, then industry and fill up that slot, and money and fill up that slot, as many jobs as there are. What I will like to go in the early game is I like to do food, industry, science, and then money. Science is much more important in my opinion than money is, even though you can buy out things with money. Science is going to give you that leg up, build more constructibles, do all the things that matter. You can do it however you want to, and again, there are different presets, city growth values, um, food and industry, then science or money, then science, whatever you want to do. The last thing or the last few things we're going to look at, this is stability. Stability, as I mentioned, is kind of the public order field. If it is above 90%, then you are, uh, it's stable, I do believe is the term. Anywhere between 30 to 80 or 30 to 90 is going to be strained. Anything below 30 and your people will actually start rebelling against you could potentially lose the city. The importance outside of that is that uh, your stability, you will need to work on stability a lot because most districts take stability to build. You see that a farmer's quarter gives you food, but it costs you minus 10 stability. And as soon as we go over what we are generating with stability, your stability starts dropping. So again, that can cause some issues in your empire or specifically to your cities, but this ties back your society because if you are strained you will actually have a harder time pushing your society but also fighting against other societies coming in so it is important to consistently look at your society uh, to at your stability to see where it's at we are increasing by uh five percent every single turn until we get to a hundred currently we have nothing hurting our stability we just just now established our city and that's why so we see down below, we have a hundred. We have eight plus two base value in your main plaza. We have 40 stability from the ideology. 40 stability, four groups of 10. And then we also just have a simple base from being the capital. So we're not gonna run into many issues with stability for a decent while unless we just go ham on district. Uh, and even then something like this actually increases it. The benefit of the Zhao is that we actually get a plus two from our cultural ability. And that means that these are actually minus eight. And we see that if we were to place a district, we would get minus eight stability because we get a plus two stability because of our culture. That is relevant because that means instead of only building 10 districts before your stability starts dropping, you can actually build an extra district, possibly even two before it really starts hurting you. And that can potentially make all the difference. So that explains the top part. We come over here and we can see population, your fortification, which is how strong your uh, city can repel an attack. We have the number of districts in your city. That's just an important little thing to get a hang of it. And then your territories. Once we add this territory, that will go up. And if we were to have built any districts, can't. But if we could have, it will add to that number as well. 
Over here is your constructions. This is where we choose to build everything in our cities. Now we can use this if we were to have something. Uh, there are a few constructibles that aren't relevant because we don't have them in our city. But if, uh, we won't worry about that. You can choose between the item icon based or a more of a list if you want to, which still gives you all of the information that you need to know. Uh, we could even do this for a little more compressed right now. And then of course you have your filters. This is um, shared projects, districts, in infrastructures, I call them constructibles, uh, units and public ceremonies. Units obviously is going to be limited by what you can actually build. And then a feast is just something, uh, a public ceremony that you can repeat on and off however long. You can either queue things or you can buy them out. If we were to buy out, we'd see we could buy out this Confucian school for 236 gold, or we could get a pottery workshop for 109. Can't do that, obviously. And then if we had the ability to buy out with the populace, we could then see that value as well. Shared projects are really interesting because they are shared. If we were to have multiple cities, we could all contribute our production values to build that quicker. We don't have anything like that now, but it is still considered a shared project. Uh, and we won't have multiple cities for uh, a, a good while. Your districts are obviously what we place on the map itself. We have uh, three currently, and then infrastructures are those things that doesn't actually affect the map per se, in terms of placing something on the map, but enhances things around you. So we get four influence on this main plaza. That plus four would go towards our total. We would be making 10, and then it would also push our society harder as well. So as for the first moves, we really need to take a look at our surroundings and take a look at what we need to uh, accomplish, especially with our emblematic building. We need food. That's a given. If we select a district, it will automatically give us the best total value. Now that doesn't always mean it's the best for that specific area. But for instance, it may do this because it gives us the most food and it takes away the least amount of things. So again, if we build right here, we will lose any extra resource extraction from a river tile based on constructibles, technology, or a tenant, for instance. But we also need food. And we get five food here, as you'll see. And anytime you hover over it, you'll see the slider. It's a very handy slider. So we exploit in a two tile in front of us projection. I, I, I don't really know how to adequately explain it, but you can see here that if we hover over it, it gives us one food uh, total in the area that we build it on, but it will also exploit the tiles in front of it. Okay, so that one goes to two, so zero goes to two. It goes from zero to two because technically we aren't exploiting it right now because it's outside of our range. So I'm gonna build this right here. That's going to give us five more food, which is at least room for one more pop. It'll also note that it gives us a farmer slot on the city or the outpost, allowing us to then put a farmer on there and generate six more food. So not only does that give us five food, we have the potential to make it get to 11 minus eight uh, because of the consumption of a, of a pop. So it's still going to put us into a net positive. But furthermore than that, this Confucian school relies on science per adjacent mount. We have a mountain right here. So because of the synergies on the district, we could just build right there. Get plus six science. That's actually really, really good. But not only would we lose three food and three stability or three uh, industry, we would also not be able to use that river at all ever again. So instead, what I'm going to do is this is sort of one of those min max moves. What we are going to do instead is that we, once we build this farm, we are going to build this. Because if we build right here, we also get plus one food per adjacent farmer's quarter. So if we were to build right here, we would exploit this. We would get plus one food here because it's next to a farmer's uh, quarter. This would generate another food because it's next to this farmer's quarter. 
And then we would start exploiting these two guys or possibly these two, which means we would generate one, two, actually three, another one, which is four, six, eight food, just from these two districts. Not only that, but that then would allow us to build this because we can't build here or we can't build here until we build something here. So if I build a farmer's quarter there, we can build here and we're up against two mountains, which means we would get 11 science total from exploiting this. This is the kind of thing you need to think about and why terrain is so important in humankind. I don't know what else we really need to do. A obelisk of the gods gives you faith. We've already talked about this a bit. Also provides you a good chunk of stability. So in the future, if you build any obelisk, you can totally do so with the thought of putting it in somewhere that needs a good chunk of stability. But it also gives two stability on the district. So we'd actually get 22. You can also pretty much build these anywhere. So build them in a place where you're not going to, uh, or least likely to exploit something. So for instance, we could build it, um, like right here. The odds of us extracting anything from here is fine. And you can always build a story about it. You can go here, say, hey, uh, we decided to build in the forest next to a river, which would be really cool. Now note, if you do build this, you cannot replace it. You cannot cancel construction. It is going to be there until you decide to build it. It will also go to the top of your construction queue, but you can always drag and reorder. We're not gonna worry about that in this episode because I do want to attach and let you know when to attach a territory and when to start your own city. Uh, so let's finish our moves over here. We have a uh, hunting party. Who's just gonna go through the ropes. He's got one more territory to go. We have the bean or the coffee luxury resource, which would give us one food per farmer. Again, that's a pretty good one. We may consider going there in the future. And then we just built a uh, mausolei out here, way out in the boondocks. We're gonna hit the intern because we have accomplished everything we need to do. We go to the intern, it is rather quick. And you can see here, everyone will then also take their moves as far as they can go. The cultural conversion has started. We just mentioned that in the last time. It is now officially going to convert to the Harrapin's culture in five turns. That's not a huge deal right now, but we do kind of need to keep an eye out. All right, so we are gonna move this guy closer to take advantage of the horses. And we can also see that this is actually going to be a pretty good place to potentially put an outpost that might make a decent bit of food. Something to consider in just a minute. We have an event here, Empire Foundation. This is going to give us our civics. We're gonna run through the civics real quick. We're gonna attach a territory and we're gonna call it into it. So with a civic, they unlock through various means that I'm still not completely sure of, but they happen regardless in various stages. And what it will always do is give you two different options. Whichever option you choose has two effects. For one, it will shift your ideology towards a certain direction, therefore potentially giving you some benefits. It will also give you a base benefit in of itself because you selected it. So for instance, if we chose by what right do we roll if it is natural, we can see that it shifts us from the center all the way three spaces to the next category, which reduces our stability but increases our science. It also gives us five influence on the main plaza. Again, influence is very important. We would now make 11 influence per turn, which would allow us to make outposts quicker, integrate into cities, um, purchase various things like other civics. If we went divine mandate, we would go more towards tradition. It would again, knock us off the center scale and give us two faith on a territory with a redu reduction in stability, and then give three faith on a territory. It's whatever you want to do. I would always go with natural right. We aren't gonna do that just yet because again, I do really, really want to attach this outpost. But just know that that is what you can do with your civics and the benefits therein. Legitimacy gives you a whole different set of things. We'll get into both of these at the beginning of the next episode. But as for when to integrate a territory or whether to start a city, I'm gonna give you a little bit of a future help tip here uh, for what we are going to do in this playthrough. You see here that we are hemorrhaging food. Uh, in fact, that pop actually happened. Remember that pop that I said would happen? And it is actually influencing and went straight into industry. We can't drag it over because we don't have a job for it. It's still gonna take two more turns before a farmer's quarter can be built. 
So in this case, in the ideal world, we would want to attach a territory that is making a lot of food because we need that food to progress. The disadvantage of taking on a territory if you aren't ready for it, technically we're not ready for it. And the reason why is because they have three out of four population. Now they are making 15 food. We are currently making minus six. That means as soon as we integrate, we might actually be making minus nine. They also have uh, the ability to have the different job types. So what we're gonna see is I'm going to integrate because they are actually making a decent bit of food and they have the ability to capitalize on creating that food. So it's kind of the idea where if you had a if you had a city, a founding city, that just was making 30 food on it. That's great, but it's only doing five industry. Think about attaching a territory that might have a lot of industry. You can integrate the populations, which decreases your food a little bit, but gives you more job opportunities to then create. So we are going to attach this and we're gonna see what happens. All right. So the thing happened that I thought it would. We are still in the negatives. But we increased by a good deal amount of industry. You can now see that the solid line goes around everything. This is our entire city. It encompasses our entire city. Our influence is minus 20 now because we attached a territory, but it's still above the threshold to where we are still in a net positive. We are also generating 10 influence from the industry or from the district's total. And you can see also that we just have seven out of 12. It's really cool. I mean, we, we increased our population vastly. And you'll notice that while it didn't seem to really affect the amount, if you would have looked and paid attention, if I would have looked and paid attention, you would have seen a leap in the farmer's quarter. But you can also see in the next turn that we only need 84 left. And look at that. Actually, we only need 74. And it'll take two turns uh, to then go and complete that. Now, overages are a thing here. So if we are, you know, I think it's, what, 12 industry over, then that will spill over to the next thing. If we were to build a maker's quarter or another farmer's quarter, it would then reduce it just a little bit. It would also means right here, this was at 20 turns. It is now at 10 turns, thanks to the industry production. So just be mindful of what you want to do. We are still going to push this way first so I can exploit this. As you saw right there, we would make four exploitations and a district depends on what you want to do. Future plans. We actually have some decent food resource here. If we were to go right here, we would exploit two tiles. We could actually drop it right here. Don't know if you can build a city right there. But we could see this actually would be a pretty good place. We are surrounded by a few rivers. Uh, we can exploit further, take on that, or even come down here, or even go right here. The point being that this could be a potential very good food generating district or city territory, and in which case we could start a second city here, attach this territory, which is looking to be relatively nice as well, and then have two cities turning out stuff that are relatively balanced same. We'll have to think about that for the next time, but guys, that is the end of this episode. You're running on close to an hour, and I really didn't want to go this far. In the next episode, I will start showing you how to build multiple cities, how to balance and manage them. We will continue with the exploration, and we'll see where this all leads diplomatically, militaristically, all of those things, because there are several things we have to get going to. Eventually, what's going to happen as a progression for this campaign is that I will space the time that is going on in this game later and later. We will start encompassing new ideas to help you handle them. This isn't going to be a let's play walkthrough. I'm not going to do all 300 turns in a single series. It'll be, I'll get to turn 50 with you, and then you may not see me until turn 100, maybe then not until turn 150, etc., etc. Guys, thank you so very much for hanging out with me today and for watching this third tutorial video. I hope you enjoyed it. If at any point you did, be sure to give it the thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, and turn on bell notifications. If you've yet to buy Humankind, you can do so through my Nexus GG link. You guys have been incredibly supportive since Humankind launched, and it really, really means a lot to me. Lastly, thank you again, Amplitude, for sponsoring this set of videos. We are the third video through of their five sponsorships 
It is very much appreciated, and I enjoy working with you guys. That's it for this episode. Thank you for watching. See you guys next time.